carry on with the meeting if anybody else joins us. Avtar Meherabha Kije. Kije. All right. Well, welcome to a, a meeting sharing about Asheville and all of its repercussions post Helene. Um, Molly Arani is here. We're delighted to have her. I haven't spoken to you live in like, I don't know, <laughs> ages. Been a while. <laughs> yeah. So tell us what's been happening for you. Well, you know, like everybody in Asheville, we've been in this real altered reality where we went to bed. How many weeks ago was it now? It's six weeks, I think. Six weeks. Yeah, at least. We went to bed thinking that we were preparing for like a moderate tropical storm, the remnants of Hurricane Helene that were supposed to blow over. And um, we woke up to complete and utter devastation in our whole town and entire Western North Carolina region flooded and decimated. And um, it's been um, really just such a shock because so many of us moved here thinking it was a climate haven where it was yeah. safely tucked in the mountains away from sort of the front lines of climate change and natural disasters. Those of us that moved here from California and are used to relentless natural disasters took a deep breath here because we felt so much safer. So this was a really big shock on multiple levels and everybody's been dealing with massive amounts of disruption and destruction and, you know, homes and lives being turned upside down. Um, we feel so grateful to have seen the community come together in the way that it did. And our restaurants jumped in to be a part of that. And it was really very healing for us that we're getting to do the service work as well as, you know, being able to provide so much needed resources. It's it, it, the whole thing must've been a massive shock. I mean, that's, that's part of the, trauma of it all but I am curious how you found out about the emergency responses and how the kitchen could immediately be put to service I, that that's interesting to me it was Mayor Baba's hand we'll just yeah, right. that. that's what it was it so what happened was we we heard a rumor in our neighbor we were everybody was stuck in their neighborhoods because of down trees or flooding or disruption lack of communication too you yeah. didn't even know what happened right yeah, nobody really had any idea the scope of it. We could imagine just based on our own micro environments how bad it was. We can only imagine right. what it was like at the river, but it you know, it was beyond our wildest imaginations how bad the disruption was. So, um what happened was we heard a rumor in our neighborhood that the public a couple of miles away from us was operating on generators and had some free Wi-Fi in the parking lot. And that's really the only way that any of us were able to get any kind of communications because we would see people clustered around a street corner. Or there'd be a fire department somewhere that had a moment of Wi-Fi and everybody would run to that corner and try to get communication out to their family and loved ones. And um, we managed to get Marijuan Rota's bike down to the Publix and was able to get a few messages out. Like each message took 15 minutes to send. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And in that moment, we got an email from World Central Kitchen, who we had wow. already done fundraisers with before. So we had contacts there and connections there. And they were reaching oh, out. Oh, wow. Yeah, they were reaching out to see if we were okay. And they were also checking to see if any of our restaurants had power because they were already on the ground and they were starting to mobilize food response. And How were they so fast? That's amazing. This is what they do. They're yeah. really good at the fast response. They have their eyes on where the hurricanes are coming, where the political unrest is happening, and they drop in faster than the federal governments aid. can. Yeah, right. yeah. They're they're a private organization, so they're very nimble and able to respond quickly without waiting for chains of command to approve anything. They just drop exactly. right in. Exactly. They also had deep connections in this town, and um, the founder Jose Andres is friends with restaurateurs here. And so it was already sort of on their radar that this town was vulnerable with this storm approaching. So they were on the ground. And now here's um, my question about that. Like, how did they know that the town was so vulnerable when the residents of the town weren't properly warned? I mean, from outside, from Myrtle Beach, 
And Petrowski was talking about how there was this storm and it was going to push and there was going to be a hurricane over Asheville. How did you not know? I don't think that they had any idea how bad it was going to be, but they had their eyes on it because there was this really large storm yeah. coming up from the Gulf. And that is a time that river flooding happens in our history. Yeah. Our mountain town with a river that runs through it, we all know to be prepared for river flooding. And, you know, the the consequences of a tropical storm hitting the mountains where you're going to get a lot of downed trees and loss of power. So I, my understanding is they were watching it with the same level of concern that we had, but because of the size of the hmm, They had storm, a better inkling, maybe. They had a sense that that amount of water, by the time that amount of rain passed over because of how wide it was, right. that, it, that they had a any pretty good tropical idea. winds, yeah, that any tropical winds were going to cause more destruction than people were prepared for. But I think they were still in the mindset of like tropical storm, minor hurricane, but they had their eyes on it. Right. And once they started to get word of mm. what had happened, they dropped in and they, they were mobilized. able to get word faster because they connected with Starlink and various different forms of communication True. were able to get messages from people. True. True. So they knew what it was and they dropped in. And um, so by Sunday, Isaac, our Isaac Clay, who's Barbara's son, he is oh, yeah, right. he is one of our business partners in the Chaipani restaurants. Oh, and wow. he, yeah, our restaurant group. Um, he was able to ride his bike to all of our restaurant locations and determined that they were safe and still standing. And that one of them, the original Chaipani location downtown had power. Wow. So, we got that message from him when Marwan was in the parking lot of Publix, also getting a message <laughs> from World Central Kitchen saying, do you have power? Can you cook? So we sent word out to anybody that could get it to meet downtown on Sunday afternoon at 12 o'clock. And we thought we'd just put our heads together, see who was able to get out, try to start getting an account of who was a who was okay, who needed help. Was anybody missing? It was a terrifying weekend because yeah. we were 213 employees and we had no way of knowing if anybody was in trouble and needed help. And, you know, everyone in the entire region was dealing with that level of fear of trying to reach yeah. their So by Sunday afternoon, we made it in. And um, the really sweet part of this story for me is we did a quick assessment. We listened to the county update on the radio that morning. They were doing these county updates on the radio, which was the only way that any residents were really getting any consistent news on what was happening started getting a sense of how horrible the destruction was. And we also got the sense that there was no idea how long we were going to be in this situation. We knew that Asheville was cut off. All roads in and out were blocked by floods or landslides. So we were an island and we had to mobilize to yeah. really take care of ourselves because it was going to be a long time before federal aid or any type of emergency aids could really manage this level of scope. It was going to depend on all of us. So we did a quick assessment and realized we weren't going to be able to open anytime soon. We didn't have water. So what could we do? And um, we made the decision to gather all the supplies from all three of our restaurant locations, gather water from breweries because we had heard a rumor that oh, breweries right. in town had you know back stock of water that they use in the process of making beer and um world central kitchen said they would help us run around and fill up five gallon water containers so we took them from our office that we use in the office and we started filling them up at the breweries and we decided to make food that day we really had no idea how we were going to do it but as we were making the decision the really sweet part for me about this is my youth Sahavas kitchen people that oh. live in Asheville started just showing up as wow. if they had been called in because I couldn't communicate with them. Nobody knew what was happening. So that day when we first started making the food, it was Marilyn and myself, a couple of people from our team in the restaurant. And then Mikey Files had been in there finishing the decor because that restaurant was supposed to be renovated for a grand opening to become Botiwala. So he oh, was in the yeah. final stages of the decor. His art supplies were all over the place. And he had come in to sort of, you know, regather that stuff. His brother, Daniel Files, had been in town helping him with the final decor. So they were both in the restaurant space and offered to try to help. 
Then Charlie Eaton showed up with his pickup truck, I think headed on his way to Myrtle Beach and just saw the yeah. lights on and popped in to say, hey, what's going on? Can I help? And <laughs> Matt Shepard showed up. He said he felt inexplicably drawn to just walk over to Chaipani and saw lights on. So he came in to see what was happening. Benjamin Goodrum had come to work with me that day because he's my neighbor and his car was smashed by the by a fallen tree. And he decided to come to work with me to see if there was anything he could do to help. So we had this team and that's the Youth Sahavas kitchen crew right that's there. Incredible. That's amazing. So, yeah, we made 720 sandwiches and then World Central Kitchen came by and picked them up in a pickup truck and helicoptered them out to these various different areas that were cut off. And after that, we regrouped and decided that we were going to do this and commit to see it through um, for as long as we could. And we ended up making food for about four weeks. It was 25,000 meals were made by the end of it. Holy mackerel. Our group, yeah. And volunteers. I mean, you, you kind of had to. Yeah, it was incredible because they gave us this World Central Kitchen flag that we hung in the window of the restaurant. So people would wander in thinking that we were World Central Kitchen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they would, yeah, they would wander in looking for help and they would wander in offering to help. And oh, we had wow. all kinds of neighbors and community members and children showing up, plus some of our employees that were coming to work. And we all just came together and made this happen. And it was, you know, the thing about this kind of service work that we learned on it was while we were in it is how regulating it was for us. We were all mm -hmm. in a state of shock. Mm -hmm. Everyone in the area, you know, is in a state of trauma and we wander in, in this state of kind of overwhelmed, yeah. flooded nervous systems and grief. And then we would put our hands to work doing what we could do, what was before us. And it really, I decided at the end of it, it's really all just a front for hugs because it's a way <laughs> right. of coming That's together right. and being together and being in community and doing something of meaning and service and purpose. But it's the it's regulating. There's some normalcy in it, coming to work, having a yeah. start, knowing you can show up and have a place to land and be with your people and get work done and as a collective be able to accomplish something together that was really needed it was really saving all of us so after a few days of it we were like we have to do this partly because we can and it's needed and we had you know thanks to you and other baba organizations and other people helping fund this we had the resources to be able to keep going and um World Central Kitchen also did their own fundraising. We did fundraising for them and all of those resources then help pay for the supplies that you need to be able to keep making food. And we were so grateful to be able to be a part of that. But really what was happening on the ground there was it was a gift from Baba to be able to have a place to come together and be in grief together while working. It's very regulating. And it started helping all of us come back down and do our bodies and feel like we could find a way to move through the grief before yeah. us. It was collective. It was like there was so much strength in that collective of coming together. It was really a profound experience and it felt so much like you, Sahavas, to me. <laughs> I had wow. this I had this realization in the afternoon. Charlie drove me some another restaurant was donating some lamb um skewers for us to make that. Wow, that's day. so great. Yeah, they had already prepped lamb skewers that were going to go bad and they needed us to cook them off. And so I'm in the back of Charlie's truck with this giant container of lamb skewers, you know, that was huge and Charlie's dog. And I'm sitting there on top of the thing with the lamb and I'm like, oh, I know how to do this. This is used to have us. This is what we do every year. <laughs> this, familiar. this sounds familiar. <laughs> cooking in, you know, insurmountable odds of obstacles and camp cooking when you don't have what you need oh, and the right gosh. resources to do what you're trying to do. And it right. all together because of the collective. And that, that felt like it just had Baba's stamp on it. And so we just kept going with it. And it was a real gift. That's incredible. At one point, you had to import water from Atlanta and, and stuff like that. Yeah, well, for the first couple of weeks, we were running around filling up these five-gallon water jugs, which World Central Kitchen was helping us transport back and forth from the breweries. But it was this constant juggle because we'd have to find enough empty five-gallon containers to take them there, fill them, blah, blah, blah. It was just, 
so hard to prepare because we had, we were increasing our numbers to provide over a thousand meals a day. And the constant juggling of water back and forth was a real problem. Also, our people were trying to volunteer and it took a long time to be able to get water for your own family and community during that time. So you'd have to go stand in water lines for hours to be able to fill up two gallons of water. So if we were asking our people to come in and work, we needed to try to help them get water so that they weren't missing their opportunity to get water. So our Atlanta restaurants put out this call to ask people to donate water from Atlanta for the Asheville community. And before they could even blink, the entire patio of Chaipani was buried under giant piles of oh. water containers. And so Daniel Peach, our culinary director um, who lives in Atlanta, he started organizing U-Haul trucks and his like 70 year old dad was driving the U-Haul up at oh. night from Atlanta, delivering this water. And this was arriving like before FEMA had water coming in. This was like in those early days. So we had the big source of water so that everybody that was working and every all the volunteers and for their communities and neighbors, as well as people that would just wander in looking for help, we had water at the restaurant. Wow. It was just in a lot of little tiny containers. So um, that's so moving. Yeah, it really was. It's the power of community, really. Yes. It, it manifested all over the place. This town, this area, you know, the history here is one of really tenacious mm -hmm. makers and creative people who have made it through a lot. And yes. um, I think it, they really showed their strength and community during this time pretty much a self-reliant kind of community, small communities that just go out there and do their thing. And yeah. And band yeah. together, you know, to really band together, yeah. bridge the divides between us and come together where that's where the strength lies. I mean, it was a really beautiful thing. I'm sure you've heard stories about yeah. it, but it, people just were putting all of their supplies out on their front yard for anybody that needed it, knowing that they weren't going to be able to just go to the grocery store and buy more supplies for themselves. It was a free sharing of resources. And yeah. the amazing thing about that was that when everybody in a community does their part, does what they know how to do, whatever that is, we have everything we need. And we yeah. were completely cut off from help for a while. And when the help did arrive, it was mainly in the form of rescuing people. So it was a long time before things like basic services and water supplies yeah. and stuff like that were coming into people that weren't in a state of complete emergency, but just trying to like get by. So the community had to really rally around itself. And on a microcosm level, neighborhoods became families and cars became communal transportation devices that people would take out to get supplies. I had several friends driving cars of complete strangers that mm. they didn't know before the storm that became their support people during the storm because they were neighbors because everybody was stuck in this microcosm of their neighborhoods. It was really beautiful and terrible under these circumstances, but also there was just profound beauty that came out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I have a feeling that the new humanity starts this way. Yeah. Sure because we have to kind of be ripped out of our comfort. Otherwise, how would we get to the point of relying on our neighbors? And That's right. Yeah. I so, hate that it takes this kind of destruction and um, real suffering for us to get there. But yeah. one of the things that I think happened was in that initial blackout when all of the noise was gone and there was no information coming in also no drumbeat reminder of how divided we are all right. of our differences stripped away and humanity was just at its core who are we at our deepest truest self that was what came out and um with all of that noise silenced it was a beautiful thing to see that happen it was very encouraging for the future of humanity <laughs> right well Yes and no. I mean, I've I've seen, I've witnessed smaller events, obviously, much smaller. And, you know, immediately after an emergency, there's all this love and outpouring and community. And then how do you maintain that? And that's kind of a curiosity to me because, you mm -hmm. know, Baba's work is hard. <laughs> how yeah. do we maintain that level of closeness to our 
friends and neighbors and and family, you know. Yeah, that is the question of the hour. That's what we're all asking ourselves right now in this community as we start to get back to some new version of things here. Um, I think there's a couple of things that come to my mind. One is that I don't think you ever unknow your neighbors yeah. when they become family overnight. So yeah. I think we see our community differently after an event like this. And also Asheville is one of these towns where I always say it's like two degrees of separation. Hmm. What's the normal degree? Six degrees, seven degrees? Six, yeah, right. Yeah. Asheville's a small town that way, yeah. It's two degrees. And it everybody knows somebody that has suffered real profound impacts from this or personal loss, either in the form of losing people or losing their homes or losing their sense of place. Um, so everybody is impacted by this and that that changes the fiber of an environment because everyone is connected to someone who or themselves who has been really impacted by this. So the question that we keep asking ourselves is how what what did we learn from this that we want to hold on to that we want to carry forward as we rebuild our community and I feel that the answer to that question lies in our connection to each other, really holding on to how we see God and everyone and how we allow that to change the choices that we make and how we treat each other, particularly in a time of so much division. And, um, you know, in our work in the restaurant space, we feel really blessed to have what we call work be an opportunity to bring people together in a space where strangers can sit next to each other at a bar and you can create an environment where everyone is welcome and everyone can gather. And in that effort of showing up for that, what we hope to hold on to is that sense of a collective, that there is profound strength in real community when people are viewing the God in everyone. And, you know, the world takes that away from us. It really works hard to take that away from us. So we're just going to try to do our part to fight back against that and try to hold on to that thread. It's beautiful. You have an incredible uh, vision and you have a super duper strong ally in Valve Zoom. I mean, that's exactly what my vision was in creating this space was that we would be community. We're all equal. There's no hierarchy. There's no... There's no like person saying, yes, this is this is allowable and permissible and worthy of attention. All of it's worthy of attention and we're all equally participating. I'm fascinated that you were in the middle of writing a book. Yeah. <laughs> in the middle of writing a book. I had to change the ending to include the story. Yeah, I hope so, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Tell us more about the book. The book is really the story of Chaipani and how we got started. And it talks a lot about how marijuana and my background growing up in the Baba community influenced what we built and how we built it and what um, what kind of business we're trying to run. So yeah, it's all about that whole story. It's incredible. I can't wait. And I can't wait to do a book launch on Baba Zoom. <laughs> oh, thank you. I got to put a plug in. <laughs> thank you. But yes, that's, absolutely. That's and fantastic. Really- I really want to thank you for the efforts that you did with your fundraising and support of rallying people around Western North Carolina community, Baba community. It was really felt. And it was the kind of thing that these little from micro grants that you were able to give people to sending resources and supplies, it makes the world feel so much smaller when that comes, especially when it comes un- asked for, uh, you know, we didn't have to organize it. You just were texting like, hey, we're doing this thing. And I was like, we're okay. And you're like, no, no, we're doing this thing. And I'm like, okay, thank you. It's amazing. (laughs) We we really felt it and it was really appreciated. And that money that you raised went to an emergency fund for our staff that allowed people to volunteer. And um, it was really, really helpful for people without paychecks for a long time. Yeah. Wow. Incredible. I mean, I I can tell the story of how Baba Zoom fundraiser started, but uh, I thought I'd save that for after uh, some others have shared it a little bit. I think that Ellie stepped away from the camera for a second. 
But um, Ellie has a big project that she was doing. And of course, Inga's here, which is awesome. I wonder if Inga is able to speak. She's off camera. Let me see if she's texted me. So, yeah. So if we have a minute, then I'll, I'll describe a little bit of what the experience was like for me. So... Here I am in Myrtle Beach, and I'm watching this weather event happen. Actually, the interesting thing is that we had the Northeast Gathering just the weekend before. <laughs> so we're coming back. I'm hearing about this storm. I'm hearing about this storm. And then I'm hearing about this storm. And it completely takes over everything. Like, I just got back from this trip. I'm like a little bit high from being in a Baba Sahavas. And immediately, Baba puts me to work on something else. You know, it was like no time to digest and uh and and at first it was feeling like oh my god like it's huge what do we do and i could only watch as charities were stepping forward immediately i see a post from chaipani i'm like oh my god that's amazing and and there's these efforts that are happening and then somebody i think it was michael ivy said call up inga she's she's doing stuff she's doing amazing work and so i call up inga and immediately it's so exciting because she's doing work on the ground immediately at that point i say oh yeah i can totally create a fundraiser now because i have somewhere to send money to i have chaipani i have inga i have like you know somebody on the ground doing real things and that's what it felt like to me was like if i was just gonna like give money to a charity and 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 you know publicize for a charity i don't need to create a fundraiser of my own but i had people real people baba people that were doing real work on the ground and that's when i started the fundraiser and that's when i was able to send inga a whole pile of stuff and she's here yay so so that's how it happened it actually happened in two directions inga was doing stuff and um daniel files I think it was Daniel, right? Daniel Files was saying, I'm taking a trip from Myrtle to uh, to Asheville. What can I bring? And I'm like, ah, I don't know. I, I, so then I'm texting Inga. She's saying, bring this. And I'm texting Michael, go buy that. <laughs> so, so that's how that happened, that the fundraiser came together so fast. I was able to fund a trip like within the week and send stuff and and then uh, Charlie Eaton put together a trip and he went shopping and I was able to fund that. And so that's how that happened. It just was because people came forward that I was able to coordinate them and put them into put them into a direction. Well, I just wanted to say really yeah. quick before we toss it to Inga, yeah. I wanted to say how helpful it was that you were getting that accurate information of what was needed because the, yeah. the needs were changing almost daily. And by the time yeah. the aid organizations would come in with stuff, we would get flooded with like donated diapers and then we had like yeah, right. 20 100 million diapers but not what we needed and then by the next day we needed something else so that like real on the ground response of getting exactly did with people that were here and what we needed it was just so helpful we're really grateful that you i know it took a lot of work on your part to do the connecting of the dots and that made a big difference yeah that that was uh especially at the beginning that was i was i was sensitive to that because as as things shifted now stores were opening now you don't need this and now you don't need that now you need this and you... i was very sensitive to it i was watching on facebook and i was seeing posts and i was i was coordinating with inga and it was just very intense but but yeah that's the thing about being nimble and and being individuals who are helping you know what i mean like as opposed to organizations like you were saying there's no bureaucracy when you don't have a whole board to approve things through and and then like a slow motion uh effort to like there's there's other baba organizations that had tried to participate but it was just easier for them to fund because the needs were shifting so fast by the time they put out a list and then two months later, you know, they've got the stuff. It's like, it's a little too late now. Yeah. Being nimble and being able to just fund directly what was needed was so helpful. And I really am fascinated by this. I mean, intellectually about how 
the world is shifting, that, you know, we can't just sit back and wait for some organization to save us, for government to save us, for, you know, our, even our BABA organizations to come save us, you know, like they're, they're, they're not nimble enough. We actually have to be a community with a fabric of connection that's, that's deeper and as fast as the internet, you know, texting and, and Venmo and Zelle and, you know, like the immediacy of all that instead of mail and telephone, you know, like we need something even faster. And, and thank God Baba has created this network of communication and instant availability of, of resources so that even in our small way as individuals, as Baba lovers, we've been able to help make some difference in, in people's lives even if they're hundreds of miles away, like it's remarkable. Yeah, so yeah I've seen some data how it's $53 billion worth of recovery necessary. It's it's an insane number. So in that sense, yeah, what, what are we doing? It's, it's at this point, $72,000 that Baba Zoom has raised. Wow, that's amazing. It is amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, thank you, Baba lovers. Thank you. And their friends. Some of them are friends, <laughs> friends of Bobble. And we've also been able to uh, collect donated instruments. So that's a side project that I'm doing now. And um, I'm going to start a push towards quilted blankets. Inga says they're super precious to people. So Inga, yeah. if you have a minute. Yeah, I do. I up. actually have some here to pick up supplies. Oh, great. And I wanted to say thank you also, Molly. I agree. Like, Angela, your efforts have been extraordinary. And the way you've pivoted with every request has been extraordinary. I am so thankful for your willingness. Like, just our conversation the other day was so freeing and allowed so much to open up. Like, you know, I, I just appreciate your flexibility and your, your sensitivity to the situation here. Cause it changes like day by day, minute by minute. And, you know, yesterday I had three calls for people who were homeless. One was freezing, you know, she was using hand warmers to stay warm. And oh, gosh. you know, we ended up getting her a heated tent to hold her over until Monday, she's getting an RV. And so that was super big win. And, um, you know, I'm sending out a check to cover her first three months of a spot on a land that's going to have electric and water for her because she had nothing. She has nothing. And, um, you know, it's hard to believe that people are still in this position, but it's true. Like there, you know, there are a lot of really unfortunate people that have really suffered and, you know, and a lot of people just don't have, they don't have the bandwidth to even ask like, Hey, you know, can you help me out? Or like, can I have this thing that you have? Like, they're just, they're like, I'm good. Like, <laughs> you know, a lot of people are like, oh no, I'm good. I, I'm okay. I, I, I'll i be okay. And it's like, no, do you want a blanket? Like, do you want this blanket? They're like, oh, that's actually really beautiful. I would love that blanket. And so, yeah, that was something that the blankets have been a huge hit with all these RVs going out. You know, there's two and three beds in each one and they're all the beds are being filled by family members or people. And I don't know, the quilt, quilted blankets have such a sweet touch. Like, you know, everybody's like, oh my gosh, that's so great. And they're just so happy to have them, you know. And um, the other things that, that we're noticing we have holes in is... Um, you know, sheets, like new, brand new sheet sets, like a single bed, a, a full bed and a queen bed is usually what's in these double campers, like that have multiple spots. So if people want to send sheets, you know, that would be great. Gift cards, like, you know, you don't realize what you don't have until you don't have it. And, you know, we, we've been passing out gift cards. That's been huge you know, gift cards to Ingalls, you know, it buys them gas, groceries, and propane tanks if they're living in a camper. They're going through it fast. I still have people on generators, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's an, it's a lot. I, if anybody has any access to porta-potties, I need some porta-potties in some areas that were hit really hard. So that's my other request. Um, we got dump trucks out, and that was a miracle in and of itself. Baba just like, 
opened up. I just prayed one morning. I was like, Baba, I need to get the garbage. There's so much garbage everywhere. And I know Molly probably sees it. It's hard to imagine the amount of garbage from, you know, like, you know, trailer homes and RVs and houses that have floated away. All this garbage is all along all the riverbeds. And I know, like I've said it before, but I've been out to all these places. You can take a rock and throw it two hours in any direction from Asheville, north, south, east, or west. And there are towns completely devastated. I mean, it is hard to comprehend that, but it's not a lie. I'm not spreading any disinformation. I've been there, you know, out near Whittier, Candler, Canton area. You go all the way out that way, there's there's devastation. You go up towards Ewing, you know, Tennessee, Irwin, Tennessee, you know, all that up there, there's so much devastation, Poplar, you know, um, Pensacola, you know, North Carolina, not Florida, <laughs> like all the Yancey County, Burnsville, Bakersville. Like I went down one road the other day and I stopped, there was a sweet little old woman raking her front yard. And I said, I said, oh, you, you're like this picture perfect North Carolina, Western North Carolina house, like along with a little Creek running by her house. And she said, well, I'm really worried about my house. And I said, what's going on? And she said, well, I'm afraid there's this big slide coming down. We're supposed to get more rain this week. And I ended up meeting her. Her name is Grace. We walked around. Her husband has died less than a year ago. So she's still grieving the loss of her husband. Has now gone through this you know, massive hurricane. Her culvert, all the water systems by her house were completely destroyed. The road coming into her house just got rebuilt. Huge boulders had to be moved to create this road. I mean, it's it's quite impressive what the Department, you know, of Transportation has done to repair this road. But, you know, she's still worried because this whole mountainside is sliding on the back towards her house. So I'm hoping that I have people going out there maybe today or tomorrow to look at it. But, um, you know, the thing is, is we need excavators and like small you know, machines and people who can operate them because there's just not enough. They're all rented out. And, you know, I had a guy who came from South Carolina this past week. His name was Steve. I said, Steve, I love you so much. I don't know you, but I can't wait to meet you because every mm -hmm. time I talk to him, I want to cry because <laughs> he's he's under my phone contacts as garbage man. <laughs> like mm -hmm. he moved eight cars off of this one family that we got two RVs for. They're going to get two more because there were it was a family compound with like five trailer homes right on this low line level area out in Fairview where the Craigtown families had 40, you know, houses fall off the mountain. Well, right down the road, there were multiple families that got completely washed out. And so they were one, it's probably one of the hardest hit areas in Fairview. And, um, this guy, Steve, moved all this stuff. And so I was trying to get Steve to go over to help Grace up in Burnsville, which is, again, it's like, you're talking like, you know, hours apart from each other with so much devastation. It's like, you can't even imagine it. And he pulled eight cars out of trees that were in this wow. person's front yard, like eight cars. And he's got them all lined up and, and there's still more. Like I was walking there the other day and I was like, oh, he, <laughs> I said to Delaney, one of the little girls, I said, oh, he missed one. She said, yeah, he said he's going to come back and help us. I hope he does. And I was like, yeah, me too. <laughs> so, how did you know, you, how did you meet these folks in Fairview? How do you know them? So, you know, we're part of this little community that does, um, uh, it's, it's called Gladheart Farm. I don't know. A lot of Baba lovers go there, but, um, it's this little tiny, uh, fresh market that happens every Sunday. And these people have the most incredible hearts. Well, Baruch, uh, they call him Brian, is like the one who's kind of like the leader there. Him and I got together one night because one of our friends does the, she has like a mushroom business. So she sells mushrooms at the farm. And I love shiitake mushrooms and I eat them like crazy. And I used to have shiitake logs. And so anyway, we couldn't get a hold of her. Um, like, you know, right when electricity started, um, we started having cell power back. We were trying to get a hold of her and she was blocked off. And she had sent out a message that she was blocked off. It was really bad and that you couldn't get into her, but nobody had her address. We didn't, you know, we couldn't figure out how to get to her. 
but she markets at that market. So Brian and I conspired and loaded up at ATV and got out there and brought her a generator and checked on her. And Brian came back and he said, Inga, it's really bad. I said, well, we have to do something about it. And so we just started meeting people out in that community and gradually getting to know them. And as soon as power started coming back on in some of the area, you know, people kind of scattered, but they served over 400 people at Nesbitt Church um, in Fairview that were displaced. And so it was it was a pretty big like thing. The people who actually started running Nesbitt, her name is Sam and her husband, they lost their home. We're getting them a um RV this week. So they've been staying at the church. And um, so they're going to get an RV. We just got four more. They're going to be delivered next week by a convoy of people from Oklahoma who just donated their time. They're going to load up six RVs and bring them out. And so we're super excited about that. And two of them will be fifth wheels. And so, um, you know, the other issue is, is like, we need cars, like trucks that can haul this stuff. Because, you know, these people don't have any vehicles, so they don't have a way to move, you know, their homes if they needed to, which, you know, isn't a big deal right now. But at some point, you know, depending on where they're going to stay, like some of these people, their land can't be rebuilt on. It's it's that bad. Like the one guy, David, we got an RV for, he's hooked up to a sewer water and power, but his driveway was collapsing this week. I got someone out there to fix it yesterday you know, cause we had rain the day before it was really bad. And so, I mean, don't ask me how it just happens. Like people, I just somehow managed, like it pivots so fast at such an epic rate that, you know, people are, you know, just showing up in my world and, you know, it's super awesome, you know, to have them just kind of show up at the last minute. I'm like, I need someone out there now. Like his driveway is going to wash away because someone unplugged something from here and there's a kink somewhere up there in the line still. And we got to get that done or he's going to lose his whole driveway and he's not even going to be able to get out to go to work. And as it stands, like there's so much that needs to be done on his land to remove the garbage that I'm just praying that somehow we get the right equipment and tools in to help him get the garbage out. Because it's not that people in the state aren't helping. They're doing what they can, but there's just not enough resources here. You know, I don't know if it's like we're just forgotten about, but like the garbage and the excavating and the manpower, you know, it's just dwindling fast. And the thing is, is like, there's so much that has to be tended to. It's like, I just feel like, you know, the the rivers, the creeks, the streams, the area around them, there's so much garbage. I saw like a refrigerator door panel just right near, you know, Bent Creek area where I live up in trees. Like, how did it get that high up in a tree? Because the water got that high. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's really bad. And they're starting the efforts to remove the garbage. I know FEMA just opened up. um, I think it's the Asheville uh, golf course is going to be a place for garbage to be distributed to. So that was something that they were waiting for was a location to distribute all this garbage. But they're going to have to bring it out. Like there's nowhere for the garbage to go. It's so much garbage, so much. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. So at any rate, but I I have a lady here who I have to load up with supplies to go out to Fairview. And, um, but I love, I love you at infinite love, Angela. And Holly, thank you for your service and for every, everybody who has helped. I just want to say thank you so much. And Inga, can yeah. I give you one one resource that I was using a lot before you hop off? Um, yeah. Because we had the World Central Kitchen flag in our window, I ended up becoming like a community point person to try to help connect the dots with it, the kind of stuff you're talking about, where it's like, wait, how do we find porta potties? And who knows where porta potties are? And one of, I kept calling individual city council members, and I know mm-hmm. you're dealing with a lot of like other counties in the surrounding area, but one resource that I found really helpful, which they specifically asked me to do this, was to email the city council members as a group, which is Asheville NC Council at AshevilleNC.gov. And okay. if, you, if you email that email with 
everything you are seeing and everything you need. They can get you the county representatives in the various different counties that might be able to help connect the dots for you to like find the porta potties because there's resources awesome. coming in, but we're just not able to connect everybody. So it's Asheville, capital N, capital C, council at AshevilleNC.gov. Okay. I'll, I'll do that today at some point and I'll That's come back. Work. Thank you. Hey, Jay Baba Bryce. Jay Baba. Lots of love. It's great to have a few minutes. <laughs> Angela, can I tell Inga something before she goes? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Inga. My name is Ellie and I have a um, two smaller toilets that are made for like sprinter vans and RVs that uh, the company donated to me. If you know of anybody with an RV um, that received an RV that doesn't have a toilet or anybody else that may need, they're not porta poly potties, but they are they're okay. called dry flush toilets. And nice. then I'll... I have them to give away. What's okay, that? Okay, awesome. I'll ask around for sure. Yeah, I just gave and one to somebody I... the other day who was given an RV. She and her husband lost their house and their jobs, but the RV didn't have a, a toilet in it and they couldn't afford uh -huh. one. So I think that is sort of happening for some folks. Okay, awesome. Yeah. I'll keep that in mind and I'll reach out to Angela and get your number too. Great. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Bye. Hey, Baba, guys. Bye. <laughs> love you all. Oh, I love you, sweetie. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Inga is on caffeine right now. <laughs> it's been amazing to work with her because she had been camping for five weeks had just arrived home like the Thursday before. And then the hur hurricane hits that night, right? So she immediately deployed. Uh, the first thing she did was find out neighboring towns, what the fire marshals were seeing and how she could help. And And she's already a nurse. Uh, her husband is a doctor and the director of, medical director of, I think it's St. Luke's, which is a little hospital. So... They're already connected to community. She's she's the kind of person that just loves to jump in and create create help where she can. She was doing that even in nursing school. And um and so sometimes she says that she was just built for this, that this is exactly like what she's good for. But she has been nonstop. Every single day is a new day and every day it's like things coming together, things that she's discovering needs doing and she's just running in new directions and putting people together and diving in and she's got this she she said that she had a bead on eight donated rvs so uh we had some money set aside from baba zoom that was going to go to a third camper but it turns out that she's got eight campers so so then our money will go towards kitting them out with you know new sheets bedding all the propane tanks, heaters, all the things that they need. So it's really tremendous, the work that she's doing. And it's been nonstop. And she says all the time, just like you, Molly, she says all the time that it's just Baba miracles right, left, and center because these connections are unbelievable. Anyway, at some point, uh, hopefully this coming week, I'll have time to really kind of break things down into a into a more like digested version. <laughs> uh, I, I have some time with her this week for an interview. So Ellie, are you available? I am. I'm a great multitasker. So I've been listening yeah, to you good. this whole time. <laughs> I am available. Yeah. Tell us more about what you've been doing and your experience and everything, everything that you've gone through. Sure. This is Sadie. You want to say hi? Hi, Sadie. Hi. <laughs> These are a bunch of Baba people, Sadie. Cool. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to tell them. Can I have a piece of candy? No. Well, go, at least go, go get an apple, please. Okay, so this is, this is mothering in action. Okay, yes. good. <laughs> Give me some candy. No, eat an apple. Ow, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, my name is Ellie, and I um, I'm a solo mom. So let me just get in the zone here. I'm taking care of two kids right now. Um, so I may have to talk to kids while I'm talking to you all. That's fine. Um, <laughs> and we moved here two years ago from Colorado. Some folks have asked um, how I'm involved with the Baba community. We are loosely involved. We're new. When we moved here from Colorado, I had never heard of um, Meher Baba. And we 
uh, a friend invited us to meet her at the center in um, in Myrtle Beach. So we went down there and I, I looked at the website beforehand and learned a little bit about him and made sure that I could be integrity going down there. And I saw that, you know, I've kind of avoided um, dogmatic spiritual approaches to life my entire life. So I wanted to make sure that I could align with with it enough to go learn about it. And um, I, I saw his his comment about the all religions being one different beads on one string or however he said it. And that really aligned with me. And I liked what um, the center's fairly low dogmatic approach and the the acceptance of all different belief systems. So I was on board with that and we went down and got involved with the Baba community. And we've gone down a couple of times now since we've um, moved to Asheville. So you've come to Baba recently? Yes, just in the last two years. Okay. And I'm just loosely um, involved. I haven't even met the, the Baba community in Asheville yet, mostly just because I'm a solo parent and I'm busy all the time. And Yeah, sure. Um, but um, I just wanted to say that's how I got involved. So last time we went to the center last April, we met um, Ilana and Mark and became friends with them. And so, Ayana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that how you say it? Ayana, yeah. Ayana, yeah, Ayana, sorry. And so um, that brings me to how this fundraiser started for me, which was, um, you know, when the hurricane hit, I was prepared for it because um, I lived in Boulder, Colorado in 2013, and we got a, oh. a thousand year flood in Boulder in 2013. That um, How lucky it, are you? Yeah, yes, this is the second one I've been through. And <laughs> it decimated. Um, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't a 3000 year flood like this was and it wasn't quite as huge of a of a an impact but it was pretty big and it was weeks without water and a lot of broken water pipes a lot of the pipes in boulder were ceramic old houses and you can't you can't interrupt me right now i have to be able to talk it's on that box of food um of course they haven't needed me until it was my turn to talk of course um, <laughs> um i forgot what i was oh so i i personally saw this storm coming and i think that because of that, I was pretty well resourced. I spent the two days before the storm. I, I was just like, oh, I know what this looks like. This is going to be weeks without water, probably, and weeks without power and probably broken bridges and broken roads. And I just knew I had been through it before. So, Good um, God, that you'd been through it before. That's just insane. <laughs> yeah, especially in another mountain town. You know, you oh usually think that the floods are going to happen on the coast. But no, That's this is insane. like a mountain town I've had a, this experience in. This one's bigger for sure, but the Boulder yeah. one was pretty pretty impactful. Um, so I personally was pretty resourced when the storm hit because I spent the two days beforehand preparing and I getting enough water and getting everything we needed to sort of live in our house off grid for a couple of weeks if we had to. And um, so, you know, I think that folds into how I was able to be resourced enough to run a fundraiser and do what I ultimately did. But you know, I would say I study the nervous system, you know, I'm a rolfer and I work with people's trauma a lot through doing body work. And I also have done half of a somatic experiencing training. So I'm going to speak um, nervous system talk for a minute, but it's been a very interesting experience, you know, just seeing where people go in a crisis like this. And a lot of people went into flight and just were like, this is, I'm not doing this. I'm out of here. And I'm not talking about people who lost their homes, but a lot of other people, you know, a percentage of people went into flight mode and just left. They're like, this is uncomfortable. This sucks. I'm not doing this. I'm not living without power. I'm not living without internet. I'm out of here. Um, and then other people, you know, froze. And I think for those of us that stayed in town, it's a combination of fight and freeze. And it's just been a very interesting observation. I heard um, the Chaipani person talking about this too, you know, um, Fight, you know, all of them are very valid responses to threat, but fight really gets shit done, frankly, excuse my language. <laughs> and it's the folks that went into fight who had it in them to do something for the community. And this community effort has, I just want to echo what, is your, is your name Molly? Yeah. I want to echo what Molly said. It's just been so deeply impressive and heartwarming to see what people have been doing across the board and across town and, um, I'm just so, so impressed by the people of Western North Carolina and you all too, wherever you are. I mean, you guys really, really have helped immensely. Um, so I would say that the first, you know, week or two, is just like dealing with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, making sure your house is okay and you're okay and you've got enough food and water and your neighbors. And I mean, for me, that's what we were doing. I was taking care of kids in the neighborhood and my own kid and feeding my neighbors and you know, because I kind of started out a little more prepared than most people in the neighborhood. And then just working within the community, just like Molly said, in our little neighborhood. 
it was just there was just such a deeply impressive immediate effort people built you know put put out tanks immediately within days and got starlink and set up you know with a road that was just covered in in dead trees and down trees that nobody could drive on they just set up tents and starlink and tables and you know mobile showers and water situations where they would go and bring a tank up to their friend's who, house who are these people day. who are just these neighbor people? people in my neighborhood oh. Um, wow. people, I'm just ta talking about the first week right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Kelly, may people... I interrupt you for a moment? Sure. Just a second. We're kind of curious, some of us who know Michael Childs. Are you his daughter or? No. I don't know daughter? Michael Childs, you're, no. You're not related. No, yeah. I don't, not that I know of. <laughs> not friend, that you know of. I like that. friend goes way back, Murphy's Michael Childs, yeah. No, I don't. Th I don't think so. My child's family is all from Colorado and and Nebraska. Yeah, as far as I know. Okay. So, uh, you know, what I'm trying to say is that um, the first couple weeks was just kind of Maslow's hierarchy needs, just taking care of yourself, your neighborhood, and in those couple weeks, first couple weeks, you know, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to contribute, and I just was sort of observing and wanting to make sure that what I did contribute to the community and the effort I was going to put in was meaningful. And so there was a week there where I was trying to start a little homeschool group because the schools were going to be indefinitely closed. And um, that wasn't really panning out. And the people I was trying to organize with, it was too complicated. So I just quickly pivoted. And this was probably a month ago. And this was at a time, the time before there were water tanks um, all over town, which there are now. Um, and I just identified pretty quickly. I was like, if I'm not, if I can't, do what I'm trying to do here with this homeschool group. I'm going to pivot and do something meaningful. I just want to make sure I do something useful. And so I decided to focus my efforts on water. Um, and I, so I started a fundraiser with this is before um, Baba Zoom got involved. I decided I wanted to get water tanks to as many people as I could, you know. Um, so I spent a lot of time, I mean, probably 100 hours organizing, researching how I could get water tanks, sourcing water tanks, figuring out how to deliver them, and, and basically started a fundraiser to drop 32 tanks was what I could come up with in different people's neighborhoods and, uh, you know, households. And my criteria was that they needed to be for individual households, not businesses, not restaurants, because I saw that those there was a diff different organization around restaurants and businesses um, that they would maintain potable water and maintain their tank and that they had to share it with as many neighbors as possible. So I at that time, I just was shooting off texts. I didn't even run a GoFundMe. I just shot off texts to everybody I know all across the country and raised a substantial amount of money myself. And then um, Ayana is somebody I one of the many people I shot off a text to. And so she said, you should get in contact with Angela, with who's involved with the Baba community. They're running a fundraiser. Get in touch with her imme immediately because they've been gathering money and looking for something useful to do. So that's when I got in touch with Angela and that's how Baba Zoom got involved. But so I spent about two solid weeks getting, uh, lining up recipients and neighborhoods and making sure everybody met my criteria for receiving a tank. I didn't want people that could afford them themselves to get them. I wanted to place them meaningfully so that as many people as could could have potable water. Cause at that time we didn't know when the water would be on. And there were some rumors that it could be six to nine months. And so I just wanted to make sure people could access that very basic human need so that they could then be more resourced and maybe be able to, you know, first of all, pay their rent or their mortgage, uh, take care of their family and themselves, and then maybe have something to give to the community. Um, and then um, it was about two weeks of lining that up, lining up recipients, just nonstop 10 days straight of phone calls from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., exhausting work to um, line it all up and I lined up the person the organization to fill the water tanks and then when I was about to buy the water tanks um, the organization backed out and said that they were now just focusing on um, low-income housing projects which was fine so then I spent two or three more days trying to figure out how could I fill these tanks because they were each individually being dropped you know they weigh 2,500 pounds or so when they're full so it wasn't feasible for each person that I was delivering them to, to you have to have a truck and a trailer and it really kind of has to stay on the trailer and you have to have somebody with a well or a spring. So 
it basically became too complicated to get them filled. So I quickly pivoted and bought instead a lot of water filters, high quality water filters, Life Straw and Berkfield water filters, as well as shower filters. Filters, And I focused on chlorine and aluminum, but all the other things, because there's a lot of chlorine being added to the Asheville water, as well as aluminum being added, unfortunately, to our, drink, our water source in the reservoir. Um, and who knows what other kind of contaminants are in there. So I got very high quality water filters that filter um, pesticides, chemicals, plastics, um, fertilizers, uh, heavy metals, including lead, which is now kind of corroding into the water because of the high amounts of chlorine. When you, when you highly chlorinate water, in case you guys don't know, with old pipes, um, the chlorine can corrode the pipes and then it releases lead into the water. So I saw that coming. I knew that, that they're now announcing that in the news as of two days ago, but I knew that was going to be part of this situation when they said they were highly chlorinated in the water. So I wanted to make sure people had a way to, in the long term, um, filter their water. So I've been, um, I received those about two weeks ago and I have been handing those out for the last two weeks and I'm doing it individually. It's been an immense amount of work. I'm like 250 hours in. So each person comes to my house and we have a process. I have a process of figuring out, you know, who gets one in the first place based on income. It's based on income level and need and what they contributed to the community and not in a, I'm not like, what did you do? But um, mm -hmm. for people that left town and didn't come back until the water came back on and just left town and, you know, kept being a therapist and making over a hundred dollars an hour. Those aren't really the people I'm trying to give a water filter for to. They can probably afford their own water filter. So it's been a bit of a process to figure out who gets them um, and then individually gift them to 80 different people. Um, each water tank recipient receives a shower um, filter as well. I'm sorry, each water filter recipient, uh, potable um, drinking water recipient receives a shower filter as well. And those shower filters um, filter out chlorine too. So I have had folks um, come to my house, individually do it. I've been telling folks that I don't recommend that they um, set up their water, their drinking water filters until the water is potable um, and that they go ahead and set up their shower filters. So the shower filters have really made a difference in people's lives. And the rumor is that the water may be potable. It's not a rumor. It's in some news articles today and yesterday. The water may be just by the way i'm i'm screen sharing <clears throat> some slides from your uh yeah i see that <laughs> um the water should be potable maybe as soon as tuesday so then these folks can start um you know using their water filters but the shower filters have really been making a difference for everybody and um it's been a labor of love and people are deeply appreciative to the point of tears and um it feels like an important thing to me and to everybody who's received a filter and it's been a lot of work but i've i've felt empowered by it and more than happy to do it so there's my download of information also a friend's a friend works for an herbalist company in california who had already sent their product out here for a, an annual herbalism gathering that was to take place in black mountain um and so they they donated all their product to me. So I've been also handing out. It's a little surprise when people come get a shower filter. I mean, their filters, they also get to to get some glycerite tinctures that are mush, most of them are mushrooms. Um, so I've just been trying to create a nice, pleasant experience where you come over and you pick your free water filter out and you get some tinctures and you have a little coffee and you just get a little joy and ease in your life. So, yeah. And you were able to give away a portable toilet, like you said. That's, yeah, that's phenomenal. Separately, um, a company that makes portable toilet they make toilets for sprinter vans and RVs. Um, donated three toilets, so they're they're pretty expensive. They're like eight hundred dollars. So that was a generous gift on their part. And I wanted to make the he donated these during the time that um, everybody was starting to use composting toilets in Asheville, but people weren't really fully educated on the fact that you have to properly compost it. It has to be very hot and mm. composted. You can't just put it in the dumpster. So I wanted him at that time, probably a hundred thousand people could have used um, one of these. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, I, and I only got three. So I wanted to wait until that was over and see who really needs them in the long run. Similar yeah. to the water filters. I, I'm, I'm really glad that I lost the person that was going to fill the tanks because actually these water filters are really going to be useful for a longer, longer term. term. Yeah. Um, um, 
So yeah, it feels, I mean, I wish I could have 400,000 water filters for everybody in Nashville, but 80 right. is pretty significant. And, you know, how many households would you say you've been able 80. to? 80. Yeah. I've given, yeah. Uh, well, I'm still in the process. I've given away half. Yeah. So it's, it's, I ultimately bought 80 water filters um, of different varieties and sizes, all that filter the same stuff. They're all the same quality and yeah. 80 shower filters. So, yeah. I, I have I'm to so run. Glad. I just wanted oh, yeah, go ahead. to say, I just wanted to say thank you. I'm sorry. I have to dash off, but Ellie, thank you for all you're doing for the community. I felt teary eyed listening to your story and I hope our paths cross in person and I get to meet you. Likewise. Enjoy. Bye, your we love your restaurants. My daughter loves the fried okra at Botiwala and oh. I love everything. <laughs> I'm sad that I'm missing out on the buffet. How cool is that? Well, it's sticking around for at least another month. So come up and visit. Oh, there we go. We have to. Thank you. For Spend some tourist dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for everything you all. All right. Bye. Bye. So yeah, the Baba Zoom um, contributed a large, the, the, the majority portion. I raised a good amount of money on my own through my family and my community, but you all contributed a good amount. And I just want to say thank you on behalf of all the people that have been receiving these. They're just really, really, really grateful. And it's I've given a so lot great. to single parents, um, teachers, um, and people that have just been doing a lot of work in the community and, and also some Baba people. You probably saw some Baba people in the photos. So can, can beautiful work. work, Ellie. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being some of our hands on the ground, our, our, uh, our workers, because that's how, <clears throat> that's how this fundraiser started was just to help specific people doing specific work with specific individuals as opposed to you know the nameless everyone you know yeah yeah because I mean, it just felt it felt good to just do something and yeah, there's so of course. Many, like thing there's so many different things that you can do a friend of mine described this beautifully and i agree with her she said you know for everybody who stayed in Asheville and has been, been doing stuff it's it's like this beautiful moment where if you've been sitting on an intrinsic gift that you have been having a hard time accessing, you know, um, it's yeah. like people's gifts are just, the people are finding ways to be like, this is what I have to give and I'm going to do it because it's not, you don't have a boss telling you what to do or, you know, it's just like, I'm going to shine my light. That's right. And allow Baba and God and universe and source to flow through me. And um, it's a, it's a beautiful moment to see everybody's kind of kicking into action and, and yeah. sharing what they, what they can and working towards what they can. It's an intriguing thing. I mean, you've lived through this before. So immediately after a tragedy like this, you see the community come together. In your experience, what happens next? Because that's, that's I think, of interest, you know? Like how... Good question. I mean, I'm seeing, I, it's not over. I'm seeing still people are helping yeah. a lot. There's a lot. Yeah. That's, there's a... um it's called Southern Dharma organization or religious community that I'm not super familiar with, but they lost their building. I guess they had a place in Marshall um, and they've, they're in the church that's behind my house right now. And they're still, I mean, there are still these stores open and they have a free healing yeah. center behind it. And, you know, um, I'm a rolfer and I'm going to offer some amount of free relief work as soon as I can find an office. And, Right. I, I see people still doing it. There's another Indian restaurant group in town, Mela, which is downtown. Yeah, you may have very been good there. restaurant. They just put out a post a couple of days ago that after their buffet every day, if you come between 235 and 245, they're telling people to just bring your containers and fill them up. And oh. it does seem like it's possible that things may have shifted in a way. I mean, I'm not saying people are going to keep giving everything, things away for free forever, but People still are, you know, people that are living here in Asheville very much know that this is not over. In fact, it's just begun and it's going to be a prolonged yeah. rebuilding. And the sense of community that I'm seeing is still present. And, mm. you know, the I would say the attitude of people and the willingness to the depth of connection that has been created with people and in the community and the depth of relating, like people are asking how you're, how each other are doing in a way that is more heartfelt now. Mm -hmm. I just see, I don't think it's over. I think people are still, I think it's continuing um, the effort to, to help and give freely of gifts. Um, not just things, but like. And your, and your experience of the 2013 boulder 
Uh, I didn't see that as much as Boulder. Uh, in oh, Boulder. Yeah. Boulder's my hometown. I love Boulder. I, I mean, people did a lot of cool stuff in Boulder, but uh, this is, I think, really unique. Uh, Asheville mm. is a uniquely um, amazing community. I'm very yeah. impressed. The Appalachians are known to be sort of independent and yeah. and uh, scrappy sort of people. I think something I would say is Boulder is a very wealthy town. Yeah. So I think there were a lot more resources and money to fix things. And right. that's both positive and negative or right. is what it is. But here it, it feels that what I make up is, you know, Appalachia is not as bougie and wealthy as Boulder. And so mm -hmm. people have had to use their inner resources. They can't just throw money at fixing the problems, nor can't mm -hmm. the city as much. I mean, the, the municipality is in, it was just a super wealthy town. There are a lot of billionaires and, and things that live there. So I think they were able to recover using money mm -hmm. just overall mm -hmm. a little easier than Appalachia can, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So I'm seeing like the grit and hard work of Appalachia that I didn't see in Boulder. People kept just kind of going to work and making their money and people couldn't that as much here so okay um, makes sense i hope that makes sense i've i've actually seen uh people say that um you know people who've been involved in other rescues and and emergency responses say that the Asheville area the appalachians have been unique that way that mm -hmm. somehow the community has pulled together in a way that is much warmer and much more uh self-reliant yeah I mean, I would say even myself in Boulder when that happened, I, I'm 45 now and I was, I think, 33 then. And I didn't do that much to help the community and I didn't see anybody else doing it. It was kind of like, you know, oh, that's crazy. Let's let the, them, the authorities, take care of it, which they did. Mm -hmm. Here, it's much more uh, on the ground. People are really doing it themselves here. Um, I mean, the scale is huge, so they've yeah. had to. But at yeah. the same time, like you say, it's it's a different community. It is. Isn't yeah. that interesting? Mm -hmm. And I've heard that too. Multiple FEMA people have told different people I know. I mean, you've seen it on the internet, but I've talked mm -hmm. to a couple of people individually that said, yeah, a FEMA person told me this is the most impressive community effort they've ever seen in a, in a disaster zone. Mm -hmm. I'm and I think the that. surrounding areas have had a connection to the Appalachians. I mean, for Myrtle Beach folks, this is the closest mountain range and, and Asheville is very commonly a place that people have visited so that connection is there. Yeah. And Molly was talking about Atlanta and how they immediately. So I think that the yeah. Appalachians hold a special place in everyone's heart. Really, I did wonder about that, too, because the amount of people I mean, I was able to raise a significant amount of money from people from all over the country. And it seemed yeah. like people. It. I wonder about the privilege of that, like people like Asheville and think it's cool. Yeah, right. so they're like, oh, my gosh, poor Asheville. But what if it was some crappy town like, I don't know, <laughs> St. Louis, Missouri or something that nobody cares about? You, you know, that's not yeah, like right. totally. <laughs> that I did to put St. Louis down. But <laughs> I mean, I've never been to say I just made that up. But, you know, what if it was yeah. just some town in South Dakota? Would anybody care as much as they did about Asheville? Yeah. That's and that's that's interesting. That makes me wonder a little bit. Well. <laughs> whatever whatever it is you know what i mean that's that's part of the grand plan whatever that means but yeah interesting how that's part of the circumstance yeah but i just want to say thank you so much for trusting oh. my and my fundraiser and being willing to um you know donate to it and you know you the baba community whoever donated money and you running it really made it possible for all these people to get water filters and so many people have been deeply touched by it. It's been very interesting because I'd say 90% of the people are just deeply grateful and graceful. And then there's like 10% of people that are very entitled. <laughs> and LA cur and... currently is the water filterable. We were hearing that it was so full of, of sediment and sludge that it was not even filterable it, that it couldn't move through the plumbing system i um there there i think that it's going to be potable as of tuesday that's there were a couple news articles yesterday that the were put whole, out but this, um, the municipal it, the it, that doesn't whole. mean it yeah the municipal water that doesn't mean it's safe to drink i mean it's like safe oh, yeah. to drink ah. but it has a lot of chlorine and aluminum and maybe some other toxins in it so I was saying before, I've advised everybody that I've given a filter to to wait until the water is deemed potable again to then use their filters. Um, so far, everybody has agreed with that and been doing that. And everybody's been drinking water from the many tanks that are around town that are being filled by volunteers. 
Um, there is a fair amount of sediment and there is a lot of chlorine in the water in order to kill any bacteria, which is what is causing a bigger long-term health issue, which I was mentioning a minute ago because You're right. the older houses... the time it needs to be filtered to be saved. But, but yeah, at least it's not so much full of... We'll just the call the it sediment mud, has been really... Not knowing what it's... But I yeah. heard it was thick with sludge and oh no, it's been that's been cut down and they've done a lot to mitigate that and get the sediment uh -huh. way down. Uh -huh. There are some long-term problems with the water that we're going to be facing as a community, um, so which is why these filters like, are important. Uh, like a medium micron filters or fine my these are um, going to fill up. They won't last very long for a while. You, or will? What do you think? Uh, the filters, these filters yeah. last a long time. They, um, like, they're all gravity think? filters. Most of them are charcoal filters. And uh, typically charcoal filters last three to five years, depending on the brand. So people do, yeah. will have to replace their filters. But is, is RO employable in that, in that situation? Yes. And I did get four RO uh, filters, under sink filters, but RO um, are very expensive. So I wanted but to get what it. What do you mean four RO? like huge ones for... no four under sink ro's oh yeah and you know 24 burkefield water filters which is the original berkey and yeah. um like 78 or 70 i can't remember the numbers of life straw filters so i've got a variety of types of filters shapes sizes they all filter all the same stuff they're all top quality and filter all the things that need well, to be like, filtered. what i'll just to get a, a better idea some better picture say Asheville what was the kind of generally what was the population of the general area effect we know be well beyond Asheville like we know Jim Meyer his place area and I have a uh an acquaintance I'm in Texas mm -hmm. I have an acquaintance here he and his wife they're 90 years old but they're still getting around. But he grew he every summer they leave Texas to get away from the heat because he grew up in the mountains there just a bit. Um, um, where is uh, it's between Spruce Pine and uh, Asheville. I forgot the name of the place. Maybe Burnsville or Barnardsville or something like uh, that. Black Mountain. Sure. Those don't ring a bell, but. It, was something and they go to their family farm you know where he grew up and he was uh, and um they were trapped they got caught in it but then they finally were able to get some roads cleared or traversable and and come on back home and why did i say that was all the whole, how much lot do you think people say if Asheville has what two hundred thousand people, a hundred thousand? Approximately, I think there's like four hundred thousand in the whole area. Half a million, perhaps. Yeah, on the area for the, how many do you think have been really put out of everyone? Put out. I mean, nobody has plumbing, right? None of those people. Well, the water has been running mun municipally. I'm in Asheville, so um, I, I can't really speak to all the surrounding towns because um, my focus has been here in town. Yeah. And as far as the water filters go, I haven't been focusing on the outlying towns as much because most of those towns have people that live in rural areas have springs yeah. and wells. And I wanted to focus specifically on the municipal water, the 80% of the municipal water system. We have a couple different res reservoirs. The one reservoir that they've been fixing this whole time, they've added aluminum into the reservoir and it's highly chlorinated water. So I wanted to fi get filters for the people that are on that specific water the source. aluminum was on purpose? They're, they had to put a lot of aluminum into the reservoir, which forever pollutes the reservoir and forever pollutes our water system. But they had they did that because there was so much turbidity in the reservoir after the hurricane. It stirred everything up. Oh. That the aluminum um, binds oh. to the sediment and weighs it down, but and that that's is useful. That like alum, is it akin to alum? It's a flocculent. Alum aluminum. 
aluminum, which is a known oh, neurotoxin. So my it's... grandfather used to put alum because they pumped water from a surface pond to an overhead container for gravity anyway, Ralph. to the house. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> Rich. <clears throat> Rich had his hand up. destroyed. How many people were actually put out? Of the <clears throat> I don't. I'm not sure. I have to say, I have three people coming to get filters pretty soon, so I have to get off the off the, the field. Yeah, yeah. yeah. work it. Focused on your work. Good idea, J. Bob. Great, Ellie. Thank Is you so much for question about that. I think Rich, you had your hand up. Well, uh, I spent a lot of time watching uh, YouTube all kinds of stuff immediately for two weeks almost. So <clears throat> I was kind of familiar with everything. But um, the thing that I did, well, that was unusual because I have sort of a functional way of thinking about things is, so I still don't have any idea. I think there were two sewer processing plants for Asheville, a bigger one and a smaller one. But I was wondering if the bigger one had gotten flooded and I never really heard anything, but I assume that most of the sewage there, because there was a map in North Carolina of, uh, they call it um, um, wastewater uh, effusion permits, whatever you want to call it. Most people in that whole area actually are uh, either on a, a small version of what's called a leach field, but they're septic tanks, you know, so to speak. And some of them have little fields and there's so much rain there that this stuff filters rather rapidly. Out here where I'm at, we don't have that rain, so they're much more designed. Uh, but um, so I imagine during this flood with all the water that went through, a lot of sewage actually went into the rivers and into the drainage and all that kind of stuff. But I was wondering, <laughs> I know it's a silly question kind of, but I was wondering, um, since people could flush their toilets, I was wondering where all that really went, you know, especially in the last, you know, in the month or two, past the flood I'm just yeah i don't know as much about the sewage i know that the sewage treatment plants held up so for a couple of weeks while we didn't have any running water we could flush our toilets if we could find water so things were happening like my neighbors have a pool and they set up in the first week a system where we were pumping their pool water out oh, okay. and using that to flush so we were yeah, filling up our, our bathtubs and i filled up my bathtub the night before um because i knew we would probably lose water um, so there was a couple weeks there where we were there was a lot of non-potable water around just for flushing. Um, but yeah. my understanding, and I don't I don't know, I focus more on the drinking water. I don't think that the sewage plants failed. That happened in Boulder ten years ago when I went was oh. there. So that was a lot more complicated on that end. But so as far as I know, the sewage did not fail. What did happen though, in case you don't know, is, and this is partially what inspired my water filter, like just the getting people clean water in the first place is. A number of things have polluted the area just in general, you know, um, in the floods, a couple factories spilled, like there was a plastics factory um, that filled and all those chemicals and toxins spilled into the French Broad River. And then in Marshall, another factory spilled into the French Broad River. So that's catastrophic long term environmental damage. Um, there's sort of toxic mud flood mud that you know where the riverbanks got so big and all that was flooded and then they receded and then that mud dried into dust you know where we have a yeah. lot miles and miles and probably impossible amounts of just sort of um yeah. polluted mud now that is widespread um and then yeah. you know i think gas tankers spilled a lot of different types of toxins spilled into the river mm -hmm. and not to mention different types of bacteria. In the Asheville Municipal Water, they haven't been in detecting any E. coli or chloroform, which is very lucky. Although all the filters I bought do filter that. But I'm mm -hmm. more concerned about the um, chemicals and heavy metals. Um, they are finding 2 to 12 inches of heavy metal um, polluted soil kind of all around the area, which is really unfortunate. And farms have gotten, you know, one of the very unique things about Asheville is all the local food. Yeah. This down here, a lot of farms got flooded and now have um, polluted soil or mud on top of their soil. So there's really a widespread environmental damage that's, you know, as when the wind blows, it blows that that mud, flood mud that's um, polluted mm -hmm. around. And so people have been having respiratory issues and kids have, have been having sort of unexplainable respiratory issues when they go into the Biltmore Village area or the River Arts District. 
-hmm. adults are reporting more migraines. So it's, we've got kind of many layers of environmental pollution now as a result of Helene that is I'm concerned about in the long run. So that's one of the things that inspired me is I just wanted to get as many people as I could a way to have at least clean water, you know, because we're dealing yeah. with air pollution. And I've been following too. And when we got put together, I was so excited because the the fear of the water there is is like you were saying all those all those factories that failed but it's all the mining debris it's all the there's there's apparently a super fun site you know people you know somebody <laughs> had buried toxic chemicals in the earth in spruce pine that was now uncovered and yeah. just went into the water you know, there's there's so much that's just insanely dangerous. There were people who were talking about wading into that mud and their clothes actually getting eaten up by it. So yeah. there's something so toxic in that mud. Yeah, there's, and I think there are a lot of different things that are quite toxic. And, you know, and that that eventually soaks into what, you know, what floods in rivers as it recedes soaks into the aquifer. And the aquifer is, you know, even though the Asheville's water source is a reservoir up in the mountains, aquifers are what feed springs and wells so some people with springs and wells have been finding now they're testing their springs and wells some of them are fine some of them have e coli or other toxins so it's a it's a larger long-term problem what's happened environmentally and public health wise as a result of yeah of this hurricane and i think we, we'll just be learning about it more and more as time goes on and the immediate acute needs are met and then those studies are able to be done so right i just at least water water is you know a daily need so i just wanted to try to help people at least take care of that one it's beautiful have you kind it's of beautiful. made the water like your little your baby ellie is that your folk your interest or yeah do you have are you functioning in some connection with the city or you are they working i'm not i'm just one one random person time. i'm just one random person because giving out 80 water filters an active, an active interest yeah taking yeah. an active interest yeah yep. i have to yeah. i have to say goodbye in just a second you all i have three people coming to get filters and kids over here and wonderful I'm very <laughs> Thank you so much, Ellie. Thanks for sharing. Good it's luck. the first time we've actually really, really spoken. So <laughs> we've been welcome. texting back and forth so much. Thank you. And I'll keep sending photos. Oh, yes, please do. Thanks. Yeah. You'll enjoy your day. Hey, you Bob. too. Hey, Bye. Hey, Bob. All right. Well, I think that's everyone who wanted to share today. Well, Angela, thanks for all that. I, I didn't have a lot of money to contribute, but... Um, I know there are some who could, but I did watch the video of Inga handing off a trailer to some, a couple, you know, and they weren't Baba lovers, you know, then they, right. but they heard of Baba through that gift and you know, how profound that will be some, at some point in their income. Well, I, I really felt like really. the scale of the problem is so huge, right? So what can we do? But, you know, every little drop is infused with Baba's love and it, it goes much further than than our little drop, our little participation. You know what I mean? Like it's it's manifesting in ways that we don't know what's going to happen. You know what I mean? But but this is an opportunity. The way I feel about it is that there's no minimum, maximum amount that we're trying to reach. You know, it's just everyone's option and honor to participate in a little way, in whatever way they can, even if it's prayers, you know. If it's not financial, fine, but like if there's any way that as we think about all the different manifestations of this problem, <clears throat> if we can arise with new creative ways to help, that's also awesome. I have this friend who's a knitter and she wants to knit some blankets. I'm like, that's amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. So, So it doesn't have to be financial. It doesn't have to be anything specific but these are ways that i was able to immediately implement so it's like inga was saying about uh, i mean my grandma made them and my mom made a few but the little uh blankets that were quilts you know yeah they make your were... home feel homey <laughs> so yeah and they're warm you know yeah but you see them on a bed and it's like oh yeah i want to sleep there yeah that's... yeah it makes you feel like you're you're hugged 
But sheets, so, yeah. Because you know, I don't. I didn't even think of sheets and pillowcases when I was watching all that stuff. I, you know, toothbrush, yeah, but yeah, yeah, all of it. I mean, they need furniture. They need like a table. There was actually a request that was put out, and uh, the Mayor Center was able to provide some tables, just folding tables, because like, uh -huh. just because you have a camper doesn't mean you have somewhere to eat. You know what I mean? Like all the above. So, uh -huh. it's insane if you literally from one night to the next morning lost yeah. everything i mean some of these folks even lost their land i mean land that you've purchased half of it's yeah. washed down the hill some of their land is condemned they can't build on it ever again what does that mean you I know, know you live your whole life you're saving up you're planning on retiring whatever it is and now all your resources are just literally washed down the mountain and and they lost an idyllic way of life in a yes. way. A lot of those people live there because of because the it was nature. so lovely. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty traumatic. I uh, I know I watched a couple of videos about Marshalltown, and it yeah. went right through the center of town. Oh yeah, you know? oh yeah. Marshall was pretty hard hit. Well, thank you. Yeah, Jay mm -hmm. Mayor Baba. Jay Baba, Jay Baba, Jay Baba. It's a beautiful meeting. Thank you.